Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Awakening Educator. I'm Megan Sweet. And I'm Susan Andrian. And we have a wonderful guest today, Ashley Martin, who will be speaking to in a moment. This is our third in our three-part series on administrators. So we started out with Sarah Stone, who gave us this district-level perspective of what it is to be a leader in education. Last time we met with Anamoli Booker, who talked with us about being a principal in an urban environment. And today we're talking with Ashley Martin, and we'll let her give a little bit of a background about who she is. Um, and then we'll get going. So Ashley, welcome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Ashley Martin. I am a currently a principal in Connecticut, but most of my career was in Oakland Unified School District as a teacher leader and also as a principal of a elementary school that was going through a transformation process. So um, did some really cool work out there at Hoover Elementary and now I am living in Connecticut. Wonderful. Well, welcome, Ashley. Um, so excited to have you. Yeah, and as you can see, we are all in our shelter in place uh, new location. We are not in the studio today. So we're all adjusting to this new world of um, keeping our families and ourselves safe. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually really interested to hear about what it's like being a school leader um, during these times, as well as generally, but I think that this is such a, a, a different time for, for leaders and in, in trying to figure out how to readjust how we do education. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, well, it's tough, right? Um, <laughs> of course. I think right now um, in my current school district, we're still trying to figure out how to do a distance learning plan. So um, our current school district definitely has uh, devices, Probably we have about 19,000 kids. We have about 10,000 devices. So we were averaging about two to one. Um, so trying to figure out how we get devices for all. And then the other piece is that we definitely had different, um, you know, learning platforms, but there wasn't a clear district initiative around blended learning um, or personalized learning. And so there's we're noticing a lot of the infrastructural issues and systems issues that are going into trying to figure out a distance learning plan when those those pieces weren't necessarily centralized from uh, the beginning so um, there are different school districts around us that already had those systems in place and you know we're easy you know could easily deploy out devices to kids uh, individually before us shutting down mm -hmm. and we I just got back today from organizing all the tech at my site and we're trying to distribute by next week um, to get then we have to do you know online teacher training because teachers don't not all teachers know how to use Google Classroom um, or different platforms like Zoom in order to deliver their instruction and so they need training and so we're trying to quickly get all of that um, together and it's definitely been hard um, and, you know, I think that that's like from the systems level, right? And then just even from the humanistic level around um, just communicating and also making sure that families have food. So our kids, you know, depend on their school lunches and their school breakfasts as, you know, two of their meals of the day. And our kids that are in after school program get dinner. So and sometimes that's three meals a day. And so making sure that I know our school district is really focused on making sure that our kids still have access to those meals. Um, and so now we have 16 distribution sites for for meals uh, throughout the week. So that's been extremely important. And then um, I would even just say how I think we all know, right, the equity challenges, the opportunity, you know, uh, uh, gaps that we see and, and um, the access, lack of access that some of our kids face. And I, in, in this, um, you know, situation, I think that it really, my hope is that other people start seeing mm -hmm. those pieces and that we're going to start to see a change um, in our community and the way that we approach uh, education for all um, because the disparity and uh, the the gaps are extremely um, just visible right now mm -hmm. I think to to hopefully more people than just us 
You said so many things that I think we, I, I would actually love for us to like break apart throughout the <laughs> uh, yeah. rest of the show. <laughs> because the first thing that I was like, oh yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. So let's, I'm going to start with the first one and hopefully I'll remember the rest of them. But what's kind of struck me from the beginning, I mean, there's lots of equity issues, but I'm actually thinking right now around like educator preparedness mm -hmm. for this time. Like we've, like technology isn't new to the world. Yeah. Um, it's not even new to education, but pretty consistently across the country. And there are, there are exceptions we weren't ready for this moment the way that we really should have been, I think. And that's not judgment, it's more around like, we haven't changed our instructional practices to keep up with technology. Um, we have lots of technology for our kids, but to your point, and again, it's, again I think it's probably true everywhere. Um, we haven't had created integrated instructional systems or really trained our teachers enough on how to use distance learning or, you know, yeah blended learning in a way that feels like um, substantive. And so now we're in this moment of like, oh shoot. So I'm just wondering as a leader for even just for your teachers, like what are some of the things that go through your mind as you're seeing this gap? Um, and you're in a, you're not a district leader, but you're like holding the space. Like mm -hmm. I feel like that's often the place where principals are. They're in this tension yeah. point between those two things. So how are you holding your staff and also kind of making sense of this situation? Um, yeah, just around just that pure like preparation around technology from an instructional viewpoint. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so I think um, uh, you know, uh, I think you start thinking about all of the things that you wish you could have, would, or all the things that you wish that you did um, to to you know prepare for this moment, and I think. Um, and, you know, you can't go back in time, um, but I'm thinking, you know, there's going to be a lot around just even teachers being able to um, access the, the platforms, right? So not even how do you, how do you deliver effective instruction in, in a virtual capacity? So that's, that's like one layer of it, right? Like how do you engage kids? Um, using a virtual platform but then the other pieces is just the technical side of it mm -hmm. right which is how do you access it how do you make sure that you can access it and then my other pieces too is just even so you know how do you teach kids in the moment from a virtual platform because for some of our children they're not used to engaging in this way not all of our families are tech savvy so when the kids get stuck how do families then help so how do we support families around helping their children to access the um, virtual learning and so there's a lot of pieces around that um, I don't have a lot of answers. I think that we're gonna just, you know, I think my biggest thing is in these times, your team and the culture and climate that you've set with your with your school and how you communicate um, is gonna be really important and essential. Um, and so I, you know, my hope is, is that, you know, already my teach, so I had to send out an email to all my staff to say who has their work computer with them. If you don't have your work computer, who's willing to use their personal device. And I mean, immediately I received tons of, of feedback of, you know, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to jump on, um, mm -hmm. you know, I've got my computer. And, and so people are eager and people are excited mm -hmm. to be, you know, continue to support their, their kids. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how this unfolds. And I just think that we have to have lots of opportunities for people to provide us with feedback so that we can iterate and fine tune uh, some of the challenges that we, that we face. And so it's kind of like, you know, you, you create your plan, but you also prepare to have to adjust and constantly readjust and, mm -hmm. and get, and, you know, make sure that you have opportunities for people to provide you feedback. So, as a leader, you can then help to move that plan and shift that plan based on need and necessity. It, it, there's so many also things in what you just said there that I think we could go up, but the, what came up for me is the thing that I'm in my space holding for behavioral health is like, how, are we, how am I 
being grateful and pointing to all of those ways in which adults are showing up and they really are there's just amazing stuff happening across our district in which teachers are doing really creative stuff and figuring out ways to connect while still also being creative about identifying who those kids and families are that are at risk that aren't don't have food or that um, there's issues of safety and substance abuse and all the other things that we're always dealing with uh, that we're figuring out who those kids are and those families are and trying to figure out how to connect them with resources. And, and I think to not go lost in the, like how big this is, but to remember to like point to, look at this great thing that's happening here and look at this great thing that this teacher is doing and share those best practices across the district. And so thinking about it with your yeah. teachers, how that can be in times yeah. of like this, I think we're gonna come out of it strong, stronger educators um, mm -hmm. we're going to be forced to develop these skills we're also have this rare opportunity to do all this professional development because typically we just don't have that kind of time with teachers yeah and I, and I think sometimes when or, and I think like when you are in an unknown situation as a leader or you know a crisis situation you know people are looking to you uh, for answers or you know for guidance, but I also think that we need to provide we need to to shine light on the teachers that are doing really cool things and have teachers you know give teachers the opportunity or encourage teachers to use each other as resources mm -hmm. because a lot of times they'll figure this stuff out and it's just a matter of helping them to remind themselves that they have you know that they can collaborate and that they have a community mm -hmm. of practice um, and to be able to lean on each other in the in these moments and so just thinking about it I'm thinking about for myself as a leader is how do I create that space or or help um, mm -hmm. to facilitate that so that um, you know people are being supportive of one another um, and that they remember to do so yeah so I appreciate that. And I, I, I agree. I think that teaching is going to take like a new level, like it's going to come out of fault, especially since I think actually, you know, depending on what you read, you're going to have to be ready to be kind of switch on to online probably more often. Um, you know, a lot of the projections are that it's going to take, you know, multiple years for this to move through. So even if we like go back to like life as normal in some ways, there'll be these moments perhaps where we need to pull back and go back home again. And so I'm imagining that teachers are going to be able to have, um, yeah, they're going to be changed in how they orient around instruction because of this opportunity. Um, and I've been so impressed by how teachers are showing up and meeting this mm -hmm. moment. Um, and leaders too, because it's so tricky. Um, mm -hmm. So thanks, thanks for that. What's been bothering me, and, I, and you named it a little bit, but it's, I'm just wondering how you as a leader think about it um, or what you're thinking about for your kids are the equity implications of this. So mm -hmm. access to technology, families that are tech savvy versus not, families that have home computers versus those that don't, um, and what that's gonna mean for the learning experience for kids in this real moment, but then also next year or whenever you get them back again. And so I'm just wondering, I know it's all new, but like it's, it's such a rare moment for us to be inside the head of a principal as things are moving. So I just love to even hear what your thought process is and how you're starting to make meaning of that. Um, knowing that it's gonna, there's lots of variables up in the air, but even like, what are those variables that you're thinking about would be really interesting to hear. So one of the things I've been thinking about is once we do launch our distance learning plan um, is going to be making sure that we are keeping track of the students that are not currently engaging on online learning platforms and then it'll be really about how do I um, you know connect with like my family community support person or my community schools director um, to help me then you know get that access to that family and making phone calls and seeing the reason why the kids are not you know engaging and so looking at the data and then making sure that we have an action plan to try to engage those kids and to figure out why they are you know engaging um, and so it's good that's one thing that's going to be really important is just using that data and then also just it's going to be really interesting to see um, how students are progressing through the online modules. Um, 
we just did our last, uh, we just did our latest round of assessments. And so it'll be interesting to see how, you know, when students return, if we do end up going back, you know, um, before fall or, you know, after the summer. Um, and how do we, and, and, you know, there might be something where we need to do summer school through virtual platforms mm -hmm. as well. Um, we don't want to lose any of that time that we have with our kids um, and we want to be able to maximize that. And so it'll be about us considering how we can, you know, continue to maximize the time from a vir virtual standpoint um, with our, with our children. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm, st it's sitting with me and I don't really necessarily have an answer and I think it's, like I said, I think it's going to be really important for me as a leader to be monitoring those data, um, the data that's on the platforms and what kids are doing and who's not engaged so that I can continue to try to see how I can get more kids online and, and have more kids access uh, the learning. Um, I do think that, you know, for kids, um, they're, you know, what I realize a lot is that they're, they're so resilient and they're, you know, they're, they're so quick to pick things up. So I think that, you know, as adults, we sit here and worry about them not necessarily having that experience, but they're learning, you know, they'll, a couple days on, they'll be, you know, taking over and being able to do, um, you know, handle it themselves. And so, I think in some ways and in, in re reflection that they'll probably be better off than the adults. <laughs> so, you know, our focus might have to be more on the adults with the technology because um, they're so much savvier than, than sometimes we are. Um, but I think it's just about getting devices in kids' hands at this point because not all of my kids have that. And then also just getting them connected to Wi-Fi which is going to be, you know, I know that there's a lot of um, just uh, companies right now that are giving free Wi-Fi out and free hotspots, and, but it's just getting our families connected to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks for that, Ashley. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting to, to, as you're talking, to think about, like, the opportunities of, um, I wonder if there are some kids that this type of learning ultimately after you know some more individualized tailored like if, if we're going to see some growth for kids that well, I think there's going to the equity issues are going to be really really obvious when this is over and I think some of our kids are actually going to have more growth opportunity because it's going to they're going to have an opportunity to sort of tailor what it is that they're learning and doing if they, if they have access and they have a home environment that allows them to explore creatively um, and wondering if there is going to be some way for us to sort of track who's actually growing at a greater rate versus who's falling behind and what are the different yeah. ways that they're engaging with this distance learning as something that can then inform us moving forward when we go back. Yeah, definitely. And then I, you know, yeah. And then I also wonder about as well as just students with special needs mm -hmm. and then how, how does this work? Um, you know, for them and, and, and does this, you know, does this help some kids more than others? And what are the variables that, that um, like you were talking about that come into play um, and who's, who's thriving and, and who makes exponential growth and who's still uh, struggling academically and just unpacking that and trying to figure out, uh, you know, next approach. Yeah. Like what's the recovery? Mm -hmm. um, so I actually have a question for both of you. I, I keep liking to, to quiz Susan at the same time as our guest. It's my new favorite thing. <laughs> I'd love to hear both of you have to think about this. But, you know, so something that I think is like highlighted and, and I've been appreciating that people are seeing is actually, in addition to instruction, all the other ways that schools are showing up for students and families that are mm -hmm. often seen and appreciated. We did a show series on food and talked about like access to food and why that's important. Um, but also safety. So I think one of the things that's also been on my mind is like schools are academically, we have a job to hold kids safe. And also actually school is the safe place for kids mm -hmm. um, away from whatever's happening for them at home. Um, mm -hmm. It could, you know, there's lots of different ways around that. And so um, I don't know, I'm just wondering from both of you, what are your thoughts about 
how we can support kids around safety in this moment. Is it going to be something we need to catch later? Um, but, you know, schools are a safe haven. And while we can do some of the instruction online, I don't know how we do that part and kind of keep tabs on kids. And I'm just wondering what you both think about that. Um, you know, this is definitely where, we, where I've been spending the majority of my time talking with uh, community schools managers at each of the sites and thinking uh, and with leaders around the kids that we're most worried about. Um, I think our foster care case managers are doing an amazing job of being in touch with that really high risk group. But there are several kids I'm just really, really worried about. And um, CPS is the Child Protective Services right now. You can't even get through to a social worker because the lines are so busy. So we have a couple of kids that maybe are OUSD police. We're going to have check in on folks just to make sure that that they're okay. Um, but then that has its own ramifications at the same time. So it feels really scary and complicated for that most vulnerable group of families. And especially they're, they're, they have such a thin margin financially. So um, mm. wondering what they're doing at this time. I'm really grateful our district has done an amazing job of getting food out and available. and. Um, some of the principals are, are coordinating getting food delivered to the families that have transportation, but it's more of the, like, what is happening in that house while they're home. Uh, and as the stress level increases, the ways in which the families are then responding to the stress is, is really concerning. Yeah. So. We, we, um, Alameda County has like confirmed about changing HIPAA laws so that now mental health providers um, are able to do telehealth that, that doesn't, re you know, usually it requires extra um, consent. And so all of those consents have been waived. So actually the mental health providers in, in Alameda County have done an amazing job of uh, connecting with families and setting up phone sessions or Zoom sessions or FaceTime sessions. So kids are getting their mental health, which is helpful. Well, that's great. What about you, Ashley? Yeah, I mean, I, so uh, we have three social workers um, that work out of my school and, you know, there are kids that have the mental health support. We also work with a um, nonprofit organization that provides mental health at the school site level. Um, I don't know of their current plan and whether or not they can do the teletherapy, but it's definitely something that we know that the district is exploring um, and that the different agencies are exploring around that. I don't have an up update on where we're at, but I definitely think that that's something that we are looking into and it's going to be really important. Um, I'm also, it's, you know, it's definitely at the forefront of my mind um, around just, uh, you know, our at-risk youth and, and what we're going to be able to do to support them and to keep them, um, you know, to try to help them thrive uh, mm -hmm. even when they're not at school. So, great. Uh, the other thing that we are doing that, that, um, I created a, like a Google form that's gone out to all of the community schools managers or principals who are, are getting it to teachers. So teachers are calling each one of their students and answering the questions on the Google form to create a spreadsheet of needs. So we're, we're, we're trying really hard to identify, to have every family have a touch and have these questions answered around, what are, are you uh, safe in your current shelter? Uh, do you have access to food? Do you have technology? Do you have Wi-Fi? Um, who's in, is there someone at high risk? So we've created these questions and the Google form's gone to each of the school sites and the teachers are, or answering the Google form for each of their kids and it's going into a spreadsheet so that we can then triage those students. That's great. Yeah, that's really smart. That's a great yeah. solution. And, and I'm hoping maybe we can start sharing some of those things out so that, you know, kids across the country can be held. And, you know, I have a, I have 11 year old now at home, Ashley. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, my, I was just like on an email, you know, and these are kids that are in, you know, are in safe homes and are, you know, there's food, there's like all the basics are there for, for these kids and um, they're, they're suffering too. And so I think it's yeah. just such an interesting challenge in that, mm -hmm. 
you know, the moms that I'm on this little like text group with are talking about how depressed their kids are starting to show up and look like, you know, cause my kid, like the first couple of days, he was like, this is cool. Yeah. And then, then the classwork started and he was like, this isn't cool. <laughs> and you know, but he was still chill. He's like, I'm just wearing pajamas all day and living my best life and it's going to be all right. And then, but now he's just like, but that's also kind of depressing when you don't have to actually get up and get out of the house. Mm. And, um, and he's like, well, when can I have a play day with my friend? And I'm like, kid, like we can get on the phone on, online again. You know, and we have the benefit of that. of Like you can play with your friends online and we set up like a nightly zoom call so they can just look at each other and like have some sense of, of connection. But um, yeah, I'm just so curious how it's going to change the way all kids experience and orient towards um, life in themselves, especially if it ends up being a prolonged, um, prolonged situation because it's, it is, it's changing how they're feeling. And um, for my kid who was like actually trying to like bug me to do homeschool for a while, cause he was just over fifth grade. Like he was just ready to move on. And he was like, let me just homeschool. And I checked in with him this week. I'm like, so how's homeschool going? He was like, yeah, that was a terrible idea. I hate it. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, my, for my kid, maybe he has a new appreciation for going to school, um, which I will capitalize on. But um, yeah, I think all kids are going to be coming back, whether it's in a couple of weeks or in three or four months, depending on what happens in each state, it's going to be different. There's a there's going to be a need of coming together and of reconnecting and um, yeah. I'm sure you haven't thought about it yet but like where does your mind start to go around that because you also you talked about the teacher community and you have this whole school community too so I'm just wondering like as a principal what are your moves there what do you start to consider and your school's in transition it's possible that if they yeah. don't come back that that sort of that 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 just ended abruptly for them in a way that the transition of closure for the elementary schools. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. So basically my school is a K-8 now and then in September it's going to be a sixth through eight. So it'll be a comprehensive uh, middle school. Um, and so it, there is a chance that, you know, last Friday was the last time that they're going to be in that building. And I, you know, which I actually hadn't thought about, um, been thinking about, I, I've been thinking so, about Sorry, that. Ashley. No, that's okay. I just, I, no, but I mean, it's good. I mean, it's, you think, you know, but um, there's so, you know, just so much to, to consider in this work um, right now um, that we haven't had to consider before. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think one of the things I think about is, you know, I work in a, a trauma saturated community and I just think for kids, closure is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, and they've had, you know, for some of our kids, they have had abrupt experiences of just, you know, something just ending and not necessarily being able to process that. And so I, I do really, you know, that is really important to me that we consider as a community how we come together and how we transition them out, even if it happens in mm -hmm. the summertime, if it happens before August, um, so that this does not become another one of their experiences that just kind of, you know, ends without that closure. And so, um, and that's not true for all my kids, but it is true for, for some. Um, and so I want to, I, I think it's important. Um, and we don't want to, you know, um, just not, you know, kind of have that closure as a community, right? Mm -hmm. Um so it's something for me to consider. Again, I don't have an answer for you guys, but it definitely is something that I'm that I'm now thinking about. Uh, and you know, I just think it could be you know some type of an experience where they come back to the school and you know all the teachers that are there because the teachers are all the K through five teachers are also leaving, mm -hmm. and so then to think about also the staff. Um, so having some type of celebration for them and some type of celebration for mm -hmm. the community hopefully in August, if this all subsides um, and, you know, we're no longer practicing social distancing. So well, it's, I my fingers. It, it, I mean, it shows the dynamic nature of being a principal. Mm -hmm. And it's always my most irritating thing when I was, I was never a principal, I was an assistant principal, but somebody, you know, some teacher was like, oh, you just sit at your desk all day and life is easy. And I'm like, oh, you have no idea. <laughs> like, actually <laughs> because you know you're you know the the role of principal is to be an instructional leader right 
that's what we say to everybody. And that's how you're kind of somewhat prepared to become a leader. A principal is that you're supposed to be over the instructional experience of the kids. Mm -hmm. But it's so much more dynamic than that you know, on a daily basis. But when you think about a crisis like this or something where things have changed so much, you know, already on this call, you've talked about, you know, attending to um, the instructional needs of kids, the technology needs of the kids, their food, um, closure, um, checking in on kids that are that need extra support, you know, it just goes on and on what a leader has to do and how much you have to move. And it was just beautiful, actually, just watching you move into that space. You're like, yeah, mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that. And now here's this thought I have. And that's what <laughs> principals do really well is they're like, yeah. oh, it's, you know, it's adaptive leadership at its best. Like, mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that, but right. So that makes me think, and I'm already seeing your wheels turning. And that's just what a need of a principal has is to be able to be that flexible. Um, Cause it's certainly, you know, nobody trained anybody in principal school for a pandemic and what that looks like. Um, so um, yeah, I don't know if I just want yeah. to like point that I, out. But it's like, interesting so actually <laughs> watching you uh, because I think in my experience uh, of working with you for three years as a partner, um, you always had like you were always in thinking ahead like you always sort of were, were you were always a visionary and moving and, and your your school was always moving towards something and so to see you in this window of like okay everything that i was moving towards is now i've had to pivot completely and move forward towards something else and then we get the opportunity to see you in this unique space of like i actually don't know where i'm going because <laughs> i always know where i'm going and uh I, I'm grateful for that opportunity because I think leaders across our country right now are in that same exact spot. And, and I sort of, and I, I want to push this to you, Megan, because your, your wheelhouse is operations and mm -hmm. sort of thinking about a, a district or a school site that has really strong operations is, is much more, uh, pro, uh, you know, positioned to pivot in this way. And I think that's the other thing is that there are ways we're showing up really great, but I, I'm hoping that we also start to shift to think about the importance of operations so that we are then prepared more for the unprepared because that piece and and I know that was always a frustration for you of like, okay, yeah, I know no one wants to attend to this right now, but <laughs> I will say that I'm sure <laughs> A lot of those operational things, you know, are, yeah, if you're not, I mean, I was hearing actually, it's funny that you said that because I sometimes forget that I'm an operations person, but I was actually listening for it in both of what you said. So you named that like in the mental health like department and even across like Alameda County, they have a few little levers that they're going to be able to do to identify the needs of kids. So you're even yeah. naming like, okay, we have a way of, of tracking every kid and knowing what their needs are and we're starting to pivot in that way. And those are those big signals of operational things that are needed. And actually, I know you're strong in operations and kind of you handle your business. So you like you have those things set up. So you knew how many computers you had. You had systems probably in place to be able to reach out to your teachers. You talked about like setting norms with communication. But you also had like you have systems in place that let you in the in a moment to pivot and actually shift. So actually, you can sit in this place right now of unknowing and look pretty calm and chill. <laughs> and I'm guessing, you know, like there's a lot of wheels turning, but also like there's a, there's a confidence that you're going to be able to, to, to move your ship where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. Where I've been worrying are for all the leaders that don't have those. And I would say actually that tends to be most leaders. Um, mm -hmm. And it's because we don't train people that way. It's not sexy. People don't talk about it. They don't want to get into that part. We train people, principals to be instructional leaders. So they're really strong with instruction maybe but they don't have systems in place to actually help them to run, roll that, run that out, or they don't have systems for basic things. Um, so I'm really worried about the schools where um, leaders don't, aren't as organized and aren't as clear on what their next steps are, or they don't have a good mechanism for communicating with their families or with their staff, and what kind of chaos is probably happening there um is one of the things that just kind of like pops into my mind right now and i'm noticing it like on a very lightweight level even between teachers right like you know mm -hmm. there's two great teachers in my son's school one was like or you know out with the parents communicating really early the other one a little bit slower but at my son's school there are systems so everyone's up and running and the principal set up a facebook page so that everybody can like continue to connect with each other and there's all these little ways that like um, leaders that are able to be more adaptive can move in this moment, but when you aren't, um, it really impacts 
that whole school community in a really profound way. So that's where my mind has been going around like, oh shoot. Um, yeah, what about the school that doesn't have a system for giving out laptops? Yeah. Um, or checking in on kids or, know, or, or a school that doesn't know the kids well enough to know that there's some needs at home that they should be checked mm -hmm. in on. Um, and that's, anyway, that's not yeah. a question, but that's where my mind's been going. So we only have a couple minutes, we only have like three minutes left. So I was thinking <laughs> on how we might end this and, I, and, and I'm, what I'd like to end on is maybe each of us share one innovative and creative thing that an educator in our circle is doing that we're like, wow, that was really a cool thing. Um, Cause okay. I think that would be a fun way to end. Okay. Can I go last? I have to think for a minute. Oh man. Yeah. I got to think too. Right. I have, I have a I'm couple. So I'll go first. <laughs> um, there, there are two things that really come to mind that the teachers at um, several of the school sites are doing uh, read, reading to their students on Facebook and they have like certain story time, story time with that teacher and, and they're doing it at different times of the day on Facebook or Instagram and inviting all of their students so that their students get to see them at story time. Um, and then one of the school sites is having a twice a week school-wide dance virtual dance party that oh. is like a zoom call that any family from the school can log into and join in the school-wide dance party twice a week which i just think are great ways to bring the as many people from the to really connect and keep community going so and the story times are adorable they're just like the teachers are super getting into it and putting a lot of animation on it so Oh, that's cute. Are you ready, Ashley? If not, I'm ready. If you want more time. Uh, yeah, you can go. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't work in a school district anymore, but I work for an organization that brings mindfulness to educators. And so some people on my team wanted to figure out something to do. And so I was telling Susan before you got on, um, they decided to host a virtual mindfulness lesson for kids. And we weren't sure how it was going to go. And um, so it was just like a, you know, a, one of our instructors teaching a mindfulness lesson she brought her kid on who was like, had it locked down. Like he was like reading all the comments and was doing all this stuff. Um, and uh, anyway, so we did a mindfulness lesson. So we're gonna be doing mindfulness lessons for anybody on the internet um, who can access it and recording them of just like sit the kids down. So it was really neat. Like you see these kids like in their bedroom sitting down um, doing their meditation session, which was pretty neat. Did you say 18,000 kids logged on? 18,000 families logged on. We were yeah. like, oh, maybe 500. <laughs> so we That's were, huge. We were ill-prepared for the amount of interest. Um, we'll be better next week. But um, it was just like, it was just really fun and sweet to have the kids talking and, and engaging with each other outside of even their own school communities, but across the world, actually. So That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so I don't necessarily have anything that I've seen happen yet, but I was talking to my gym teacher and he's just really excited about being able to do kind of virtual uh, games. Uh, he's got some ideas of the things that he's going to do. Um, and I just, again, I think it's going to be so important, like you guys said, to have kids connect with one another. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's probably going to be a highlight of their day. Um, so I'm excited to see what he does with that. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ashley, for coming thank on. You. We miss you here in Oakland. And, um, you, <laughs> you know, we're, that we were expecting to talk about. I was had this whole thing of like East Coast, West Coast. I know. Like, I, different. <laughs> and um, this was. I really wanted to talk about budgets because I know your budget is better than our budget. So I, I was curious about that piece. But maybe, maybe another time at a different yeah. time, we could have the yeah. East Coast, West Coast, or state by state. Funding. funding formula and yeah, yeah that's different <laughs> yeah and like what that actually means for kids on a day so yeah yeah but it's really exciting to talk to you now I really appreciate you taking the time out of what I'm sure is a really thank busy you guys schedule. for having me um yeah because what a great opportunity to talk to a leader in the midst of this kind yeah. of change and um to, to have the conversation so thank you Ashley and thank you Susan thank you Megan I thank miss you, you and miss you all and uh, 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 maybe be back in the studio at some point <laughs> fingers crossed <laughs> All right.